Last time I kind of introduced you mostly to the machinery of this uh, gauge potentials and going to the moving frame and showed some examples like, I don't know, we, we discussed how we get the mass. And um, today I mostly want to continue to various applications. And uh, I will mostly use slides. I will have much fewer derivations because if you talk about interesting in applications, they're like lengthy. Uh, there are many optional exercises which will be, uh, which actually are mostly taken from this review. I understand you probably won't have time now, but if you are interested, at least I urge you to go through them. Because if, 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 you, if you don't do anything with your hands, I don't think you will learn that much. So, and uh, these are like very specific applications which are kind of close to my own interest, but I'll try to maybe convince you that they cover a broad range of topics, and definitely they're related to many more topics which I really don't know much about. So you might see something familiar, especially if you have high energy background or something like that. Anyway, so I, it, it's just a reminder, we went through this example, we discussed geometry of spin one half. Uh, so it, it's a slightly different expression for the ground state wave function, but they define up to a phase, so it's completely equivalent. And then you can uh, do this exercise. We did it last time, and you can get Berry curvature. You can get the metric and symmetric of the sphere. So, and then I also told you briefly, and I'm sure like many of you know it's much better than me, that. Uh, Berry curvature is uh, notorious for uh, uh, being related to uh, 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 quantization, uh, and which appears in many physical phenomena like quantum Hall effect. And in particular, if you take any closed manifold of parameters, it doesn't have to be momentum space in some crystal. It, it, it could be just, uh, you can imagine that you have a system with some couplings. And as long as this coupling space forms a closed manifold, if you do this integral, you will get um, 2 pi times an integer. And then I also said in words, and, and uh, this is something uh, uh, we know from mathematics, that there is an another uh, set of uh, invariants, uh, which are relate, uh, known to early characteristics. And those are related to the metric tensor. They're related to formally to curvature. but there are some long expressions which I honestly don't remember, but these are some derivatives of the metric tensor. Uh, so if you define this distance between wave functions, you have a natural notion of distance, you have a natural notion of metric, and you can try to define uh, 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 phases using uh, this oil attack characteristics. So I'll show you one example how it works, and uh, you see funny things near critical points, near phase transitions. And then I move on to dynamics. So uh, I'll just show you mostly some pictures and briefly discuss how one can do uh, calculations in, in uh, a somewhat more complicated but still solvable example. It's known as XY chain. So this is a one-dimensional chain where we have uh, XX coupling, YY coupling, and Z coupling. And this is uh, a model which is sort of like an A, I, A, B, C of quantum phase transitions. And originally, uh, Alexei actually asked me uh, to, to give lectures on quantum phase transitions. And if I would do it, I will probably discuss half of the lecture details of this model. So if you saw it, great. If you did not, uh, there is an excellent review in, in Subir Sajdev, my advisor, book, Quantum Phase Transition. He really discusses how you solve this problem and how you understand the results and put them on general ground from a renormalization group, universality, critical exponents, this, that, and so on. So, uh, uh, and this is really like Ising model, and it's actually very similar to classical Ising model, which was solved for Anzager in two dimensions. So, and because it's exactly solvable, we learned a lot about this. So, let me just say without many details that uh, this model um, uh, maps to free fermions. And uh, the reason um, is uh, uh, very simple and in some sense 
it's kind of very deep because uh, uh, this underlying, it's known Jordan Wigner transformation, shows us how we can construct fermions, anti commuting objects, out of real objects we're dealing with. Not numbers, but matrices. So, and roughly it works like this. So, if you look into a single spin, it's almost like a fermion, right? Spin one half. There are only two states, up and down. Let's associate down with, say, empty and up with full. So we can say that roughly sigma z will be, as equal, uh, will be equal to 1 minus 2n, right? So let's say inside j. So if spin is down, it's like it's occupied. If it's n is equal to 1, if spin is up, it's empty. Now, what is sigma plus in this language? Well, sigma plus, remember it's sigma x plus i sigma y. It's a raising operator, so it moves us from up plus down. So I, I might be sloppy with c and c dagger. I, I don't really want to think about it. It's either this or the opposite. So uh, yeah, probably in this convention, yeah, I'm not going to think about it. I, I cannot think now. Anyway, and then sigma minus will be like cj. So this is perfect, except that if we take now different sites, then these guys, these two, anti-commute, well, this commute. So this cannot be really uh, the whole story. But then there was this um, uh, very clever trick that actually what we can do, we can add a string. And, and this trick really is useful only in one dimension. So we can start counting from some point. So these are my sites, spin sites. And I can uh, oh, let me just do it opposite. I will say that C dagger will actually count number of electrons or number of spins up, if you want, before site J. So I'll put 1 minus 2 and, sorry product of a k less than j, 1 minus 2 and k times sigma plus j. So I'm adding product of essential occupation numbers. So this is either plus 1 or minus 1. So it's clear that c, plus, c dagger will be either plus sigma plus or minus sigma plus. And now, without any calculations, you immediately see why these guys will anti-commute with this definition. Because suppose that i is less than j. Then if we look into this guy acting on some state, it will first kill particle on site i, right? And then uh, we will kill particle, we will act on site j with cj, right? So it actually means that this guy will effectively create a minus sign in front of cj, right? On the other hand, if we look into this guy, this won't happen because we first look cj and i is less than j, so it's not affected by j. So you can immediately see that if we insert the strings, we satisfy correct anti-commutation relation. So why it, it, it's useful only in one dimension? Well, it's clear because in two dimension you have to do some uh, snake or whatever because how do you count sites? And this makes, uh, it, it, and formally the construction works, but it makes everything extremely uh, non-local. In 1D we keep locality because if you look into this Hamiltonian, we have say sigma x on this side times sigma x on this side. Well, this can, will contain string and this will contain string. But these strings here, they will cancel each other. So it's only, we have to worry only about this one side. And now it's really a matter of algebra. Just really use these expressions. Well, you can invert it, obviously, it's the same. Use these expressions to convince yourself that this Hamiltonian becomes a superconducting Hamiltonian. So it's essentially, so this Hamiltonian uh, actually maps into a Bogolubov Hamiltonian, so it will be uh, essentially sum over cosine theta k 
CK up dagger CK up plus CK down dagger CK down plus or minus sine theta k ck up dagger ck down dagger plus ck down ck up something like that I, uh, signs could be wrong could be minus sign so uh, uh, well the model is translation invariant so you can write it in momentum space and cosine theta k and side theta k they're given by uh, whatever, these expressions. So it's really, you just take this original Hamiltonian, uh, plug this jordan Wigner transformation, and go to a Fourier space. And now you can notice, perhaps, that uh, uh, this uh, Hamiltonian is again equivalent to ensemble of two-level systems. And that's great, because we just discussed one two-level system. So when we have many two-level systems, it's easy. <laughs> And uh, you can just see what, what happens. So this term like conserves number of particles in each momentum space. So suppose we have, uh, we start from zero particles here. So this can create uh, two particles. Oh, they're actually spinless, sorry. CK, C minus K, yeah. Anyway, there's no up and down, there is K and minus K. Doesn't matter. These are spinless fermions. So there's probably minus sign. <coughs> anyway, so uh, uh, what you can do, you can create two particles in momenta k and minus k, or you can kill these two particles, and, and that's pretty much it. So there are no terms which can change parity, which cannot move you from, say, 1k fermion to uh, 2k fermions. You can only go from 0 to 2, or yeah, from uh, 1k to 1 minus k. And because of that, this model is solvable, because we, we can solve two-level system, right? I don't know, this thing stopped working. Okay. So now, <coughs> this you, 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 you just need to trust me. So this model uh, has a very rich phase diagram. So it has uh, various phases. And I'll just explain in words what they are. So <coughs> sorry. if our magnetic field is strong, spins are mostly polarized in, in uh, z direction. And this is like what's known as quantum paramagnet. So it's paramagnet because we have magnetic field along z and spins are polarized along z. That's what paramagnets do. <coughs> but if magnetic field is 0, then actually, depending on gamma, so depending on gamma, spins want to polarize either along x direction or along y direction. So if, for example, gamma is bigger than 0, then this coupling is bigger than this coupling, so they want to polarize along x. If gamma is less than 0, they want to polarize along y. If gamma is equal to 0, they actually don't know what to do. And this is another critical point. So they can polarize along any direction, x or y. So, and uh, 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 this uh, uh, phases ferromagnet, they have spontaneously broken symmetry. So I can only go through a phase transition from ferromagnet to paramagnet. And this is a second order phase transition. And, and then there is another one at gamma equals to zero. Anyway, so it's a rich model. It has all critical exponents, as I said, diverging correlation lengths, and so on. But what I want to show is how we can understand this phase diagram through geometry. It's kind of interesting. So we can ask the question. I mean, we discussed what geometry of spin 1 half, and we got kind of a trivial answer. If you have spin in a magnetic field, geometry of the spin is sphere. And you cannot have anything else, because it's completely symmetric, right, with respect to direction of magnetic field. So, so the only thing we could uh, find from this calculation is what's the radius of the sphere that is proportional to spin and not, say, spin squared or something like that. But here, it's, it's much less trivial. So let's do this. Well, since it's a bunch of two-level systems, gauge potentials are very simple. 
So we know that gauge potential with respect to, so our, yeah, sorry, and there is one more thing. So when we break anisotropy along x and along y, obviously there is a continuous symmetry. We can break it not along x, but along direction like 45 degrees between x and y. So there is an extra, it's known U1 symmetry, uh, which is good. And this is characterized by phase. I can just add it as an extra parameter. So of course, energies do not depend on this phase. But our metric does, because if I change this phase, I change wave function. <coughs> so now, uh, well, we, we can uh, find gauge potential. And that becomes trivial, because my wave function is a product state. Gauge potential is, sum of, uh, is a sum of gauge potential. It's exactly like for Hamiltonians, right? So if you have product of wave function and energy set up, Hamiltonian set up. So it's exactly the same here. Oh, it's, Technically, because when you differentiate product, you will get sum of terms. OK, so now we know that gauge potential with respect to H, what is H? Well, H is a parameter which defines my theta. So I can say that derivative with respect to H is derivative with respect to theta times d theta dh. But gauge potential with respect to theta is tau y. We discussed that. So same with phi. Uh, uh, well, it would be tau z on the equator, but not in the equator. It's like whatever. It's a power. Sorry, it's a Pauli matrix in this space. I apologize. So sigma is original spin, and tau is a Pauli matrix in in the space of fermions. So I used a different notation, not to confuse. So this is my effective two-level system. So each tau is actually non-local object containing uh, this. Uh, Fermions. OK. So now you can just evaluate it and plug it in Mathematica. I have to admit, uh, it was not an easy calculation. I, I spent like several weeks fighting with Mathematica. Um, and uh, you, you can just try it. It's, it's very simple. You plug it in, and you get an error message. Uh, but. I don't know. I, I did it some years ago, so maybe now you, you can do it. But anyway, so, uh, and actually, parts of these results were obtained before by Zanardi, so uh, apparently uh, it's doable. So you can calculate this metric components, and this is an example. So you can also do G gamma gamma, so GHH, G phi phi. Uh, it's symmetric, there is no GH phi, so in this sense, it's good. So, and we already see that from this metric, there are sort of interesting things happening. And now there is a general theme which is um, uh, quite popular. There are many papers in qu quantum information community and, uh, under the name is information or fidelity approach to phases and phase transitions. And sort of people uh, like it in some sense that nor normally, we say in order to characterize phase, uh, phases or phase transitions, we want to introduce some other parameter. But what if we don't know what's the other parameter? What if there is no broken symmetry? What do we do? And this is one of the natural approaches. So it's clear that uh, if we ask how fast wave function, ground state wave function changes, we in some sense are free from any assumptions. Like whether we know what the, there could be some string or the parameter which we don't know. Or the parameter might not exist even if you have topological phase transitions. So this is like a natural uh, measure. And indeed, in this model, we see that this metric tensor, or how fast wave function changes, if you want, it has singularities. And it has singularities exactly when we want the uh, singularities to appear. So if we look into GHH, we see that there is singularity when gamma is equal to 0. And this is, remember, our uh, uh, an isotropic transition, so we can go from x to y ferromagnet. And there is a singularity when h is equal to 1. And that's exactly when we go from ferromagnet to paramagnet. And moreover, this singularity, so these coefficients, like 1 over 16, these are fine-tuned numbers. So if you change the model, this 1 over 16 will become something else. But these powers are completely universal. So you can just really prove, and the reason is that uh, these metric tensors you can exp express through susceptibilities, and those are universal by scaling theory and so on. Same with G5 phi, so it, it's singular 
when gamma goes to zero, it's absolute value, so it's like non-analytic function. Uh, right. OK, so that's nice. So it's already something. Uh, and by the way, diagonal components of geometric uh, metric tensor are, are called fidelity susceptibility. So if you ever heard this name, that's what they are. So metric tensor is a bit richer. It contains diagonal of diagonal components. OK, so we already got something. So we can characterize uh, our phase. We know where transitions are, and so on. But we can do something interesting. I think we can ask, can we really find a surface which corresponds to this metric tensor? Well, here in principle, we have three parameters. So that means that I should be able to embed it in four dimensional surface. I have no clue what they are. So if you have imagination which allows you to work in four dimensions, uh, that's an excellent exercise. But the only thing I can imagine is two dimensional surface in, in, in three dimensions. So therefore, you can look into cuts. And nice, I'll show you all cuts. So the simpler cuts in uh, H5 plane. So we, look, uh, we fix gamma, and we look into H5 plane, and we ask how the surface looks like. And then we can do uh, this procedure, which is, of course, very well known in many fields. Uh, <coughs> I think when you do magnetic MRI image, that's, that's exactly how you restore this information. So you have uh, this metric, quantum metric, which is determined by your wave function. And then you ask, can I build a surface in three dimensions which has exactly the same metric? <laughs> so you need to find some function, z, r, and this phi, such that this will match this. It turns out it's a fairly unique procedure up to some simple transformations. So, but here, uh, because we have symmetry, cylindrical symmetry, it's actually extremely natural to associate phase or angle on the surface, I mean cylindrical coordinate, with my phase. So you just match phi to phi. And after that, uh, everything uh, is, all, is set. So I can see that r has to be equal to square root of g phi phi. That's the radius of the surface. And then if I plug it this r here, I'll see that, and then I can move it to the other side, I see that my z is found from this differential equation. So I can integrate it. So dz, it should be dz dh, I apologize. It's not dz, it's dz over dh. So I, I can integrate over h, and I find z. So And this is unique surface, which I can find. Yeah, and it's interesting in some cases, expression under the square root is negative, and then you cannot embed it in Euclidean space. You have to do it in Minkowski space. I have no clue what it means. But it's fun. It's fun. So, and that's the answer. So, this is really how transfer fieldizing phase diagram looks like. So uh, as I said, this is a fairly unique surface. It consists of three parts, a cylinder. And this is your ferromagnet. And then two hemispheres. And this is your paramagnet. So of course, this is nice. And then one can ask, but how stable it is? And obviously, details cannot be stable. But here comes the Euler characteristic. So. If you look into the shape, you immediately see that total Euler characteristic is trivial. It's two. So in this sense, if you have a phase transition here or you don't have a phase transition, it doesn't matter. It just characterizes our uh, manifold. And, and uh, second order phase transition cannot introduce you any discontinuity. It can introduce you some curvature singularities or whatever, but not discontinuity. So nothing interesting happens here. But an interesting thing is that this Euler characteristic, this two, consists of three parts. So there is one which comes, comes from half of the sphere at h less than minus 1. There is zero which comes from cylinder. And there is another one which comes from half of the sphere. And this turns out to be completely universal. So now you can prove, and the proof is really easy, that whatever you do to your face, 
this uh, contributions 1, 0, 1 will always remain the same as long as you don't change the nature of the phase transition. And the reason is sort of is very simple uh, physical reason. So it, it, there is another version of this Euler theorem which tells you that if you had bulk integrated bulk curvature plus geodesic curvature, geodesic curvature tells you how far your boundaries from geodesic. So if it's this exactly ge geodesic, then it's zero. If it's not, then it's non-zero. So, but phase boundary always lies on geodesics. And the reason is that geodesics is the shortest distance. And then you just think about it. If you try to leave your phase, your wave function starts changing like crazy. So it means you have a huge distance in terms of wave function. So if you want to find the shortest distance from one point on, a, phase, uh, on uh, a boundary between phases to another point, you will always stick to a boundary. And this means that geodesic curvature is always zero. So it means it's, 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 it's as I said, universal. Just another example, if you go to gamma phi plane, and there is uh, something else happening. So remember, gamma is an isotropy parameter. And there, if uh, h is less than 1, we are in ferromagnet. We have a phase transition. It turns out there is a conical singularity. And total curvature, well, you can continue it if you make gamma negative just to make it close. Anyway, total integral here is 1, not 2. It doesn't matter. Uh, so this is completely universal. It's, it's set by parameters. But then 1 over square root of 2 comes from this cone. And this cone corresponds to gamma equals to 0 and corresponds to the phase transition. So it means if you integrate your curvature everywhere except the phase transition point, you will get this missing 1 over square root of 2. Uh, and or probably 1 minus 1 over square root of 2. And if you're in paramagnet phase and gamma equals to 0 is not special, and then you have just this semi hemisphere, so there are no singularities here. And this 1 over square root of 2 is kind of very funny. It's a universal combination of anisotropy and critical indices. Universal, which it doesn't. Critical indices do change if you reparameterize uh, your fields. Like if you, instead of t minus tc, use minus t minus tc squared, or h minus hc squared, you'll get different critical indices. These objects are robust. What they mean, again, I also have no clue. Anyway, this is just uh, fun. So let me go back to the response. So I, I, I really don't know what to do with that. And uh, the good thing that this can be measured. So, so far, I guess I was not pushy enough, uh, or other people were not pushy enough to convince experimentalists measure this metric tensor. But it, it's really easy. It's expressive susceptibilities if you measure dissipation. It's a simple experiment, actually, to measure. Anyway, <clears throat> so let me go back to, to non-adiabatic response. So uh, I already uh, mentioned that uh, if we treat, so this is our moving frame Hamiltonian. Uh, I'm going back to the simple system, but sort of discussion is general. So uh, if we move slowly, we treat this as a perturbation. And if leading order of perturbation theory, we just get correction to the effective energy. It's not real energy. It's effective energy. But that's what defines phase of the wave function in the moving frame, right? And then uh, we can say that there is extra contribution to the phase due to this extra contribution to the effective energy. And this is exactly this uh, Berry phase. So uh, there are, of course, other derivations of this. But if you go to a moving frame, it's just normal perturbation, so we don't need to introduce some other derivations. And moreover, with these other derivations, it's really hard to go beyond. You have to use many words and so on. Let me try to go beyond this first order perturbation theory. And now, again, I'm using static perturbation theory because I'm assuming this is both small and slowly changing. And I will show you, I'll flash you a full derivation in t using time dependent perturbation, so you'll get the same results. So, this is, uh, well, this is tilde notation. It doesn't matter, it comes from, I guess, a different talk. <coughs> it doesn't matter. So, this is a perturbation. And now I'm saying, well, without this perturbation, I say follow the ground state. It doesn't have to be ground state, some eigenstate, right? 
And then if I add the perturbation, I just use first order of perturbation theory. And then my correction to the wave function, if you remember, so my perturbation is minus a times lambda dot, right? So it means that my correction, psi 1, up to the signs will be sum over n not equal to 0, lambda dot n, well, let me put it, a lambda 0 over e n minus e 0, right? But remember, we discussed that this is the same as i d by d lambda. But this matrix element is the same, again, up to the sign as i n t lambda h 0 divided by another n minus 0. Remember, we discussed that this matrix element is equal to the matrix element of d lambda h over energy denominator. So we actually get almost identical result to static perturbation theory, but we get extra energy denominator. But it has to be the case by dimensions. Because if you would put lambda here, we'll get energy denominator. We put dot. Dot has to be compensated. Dot actually, it's h bar over time. It's extra energy. So we have to compensate it by some energy. So by dimensions, it has to be the case. But beyond that, it's an identical expression. So now we can just apply this perturbation theory and, and find expectation value of some observable. And it's actually very convenient to express observables as generalized forces. So if you want, it's like I'm introducing a source. So magnetization, so I can write, for example, magnetization is minus dhx of the Hamiltonian, right? Polarization will be minus dex of the Hamiltonian, and so on. So any, any observable, P is not pressured, probably, anyway. So any observable I can write as, as a generalized force. It, it's just convenient. So that's what I'm doing. So and uh, generalized force can be with respect to some other parameter. I'm changing voltage. I'm looking into current. Or I'm changing magnetic field. I'm looking into electric susceptibility. Could be the same. Could be different. So, but in general, if you want to be general, we introduce parameter beta. And then we just apply this perturbation theory. So in the leading order. Well, for next leading order, we'll get psi 1 is d beta h psi 0, right? Plus psi 0 d beta h psi 1, right? To the order of delta lambda. But now let's look. So there is i here. So it means when we have psi 1 here, we'll get minus sign. When we have psi 1 here, we'll get plus sign. So we'll get minus expression. Then we will get energy denominator squared, which comes from correction to the psi. And we get two matrix elements. One matrix element of this d beta h, of what we are looking at, and one matrix element of d alpha h, what we are changing. Right. So, But remember, I can use this trick which I just wrote one more time, I can now absorb energy denominator to replace d beta h of energy denominator to d beta or a beta. So I absorb it, and because of a minus sign, if you stare at it, you'll realize that the response is exactly the Berry curvature. It's expectation value of commutator of a beta and a alpha. Does it remind you something? Uh, I should remind you Coriolis force or Lorentz force or whatever. So it's a completely general result. So non-adiabatic response, linear in velocity, is given by Lorentz force or Coriolis force. It's the same. In many cases, Lorentz force is just 0. In many cases, we don't see it. But if it's non-zero, this is the leading response. So you can convince yourself that you can recover this Foucault pendulum in this way. And you even don't need to do any calculations, because we know that our gauge potential in this case is angular momentum. So by going to a moving frame, uh, we introduce this extra term in the Hamiltonian. And then you just open Landau-Lifschitz. 
But here I derived it as a perturbation theory, and there is exact result. Why? Well, because it's quadratic in momentum. Try to add p power of 4, and then you'll get something more complicated. But if your velocity is small, you'll again recover Coriolis force as a leading perturbation. Now it will be only true if Earth's rotation is slow. And it turns out that this has been measured in, in the superconducting qubit. So again, I will not go into many details of derivation. But this is a fairly standard setup, uh, setup for, for a qubit. So we have a two-level system. It's, of course, a superconducting device. But if you look from afar, then this device is, is, is described by this simple formula. So it's really two states of a qubit. Sorry, what's the term small? I will. <laughs> I, let me put it this way. So I rediscovered it for myself many times, and each time I was forgetting. So I'm not going. It's a, a particular, it's whether you use current state of a qubit mostly as, as your qubit state or charge state. I think transpon is like current state. Um, Charge state, opposite, OK, so see. So don't trust me on this. <coughs> it's good to have collaborators who are former experimentalists. So it's like Mike Kaladrubitz. Then all translation was done by him. So anyway, so I will tell you what I understand. And this is stars here, not, not here. So <coughs> we have effectively two states. Uh, uh, which we call up and down of qubit, and there is electric field, which yeah, it probably that's why it's charged. It, it can move be between two st charge states. Now <coughs> we can, uh, or experimentalists can oscillate this f uh, field in time, and they usually oscillate at, at frequency which is uh, close to this frequency. It's called omega q plus epsilon. So there is a small detuning. And then you can use Floke formalism, which Eugene mentioned a little bit, and I don't know, maybe Dimo or others will, will mention you in all detail, in more detail, but it's basically like going to a rotating frame and using the fact that this omega q is, is fast. It's like sort of like a pizza pendulum. And then <coughs> if you know it's a really simple calculation, if you don't, you, you have to kind of learn this formalism, perhaps, you will find that effective static uh, Hamiltonian is given by just static sigma z, which is nothing by detuning, so difference in frequencies. And you have effectively studying, uh, static sigma x, uh, which is just governed by this Rabi frequency omega. So it's really our two-level system. And now uh, what has been done in, in this Boulder experiment, Conrad Leonard group, I think Mike Schroer was, was the main uh, author. They tried to really uh, measure this Berry curvature in this simple case, measure this Coriolis force for a qubit. <coughs> so what they do? Well, they effectively change slowly the tuning and the Rabi frequency in time. They have full control. So like shown in this top panel, so, uh, so I, uh, uh, the tuning will be like epsilon. And amplitude is like Rabi frequency. And you see, you start from 0. You start from some, uh, you just initialize the state in some, say, large positive detuning. It's like large magnetic field along z and zero magnetic field along x. Then you slowly change magnetic field along z to, from plus to minus. And at the same time, you increase magnetic field along x and then decrease it. So it's kind of you're moving along this, not sphere, but say ellipsoid, but anyway, all topological numbers, they're invariant, so it doesn't, shape doesn't matter. And then they move it slowly, and then what you expect if you very slow? Well, you know that there is a standard adiabatic theorem, right? Spin should follow the magnetic field. So it means that you start from sigma z, blue, which is 1, you polarize along a, h, and then it slowly changes to minus 1. So spin indeed follows the magnetic field. Sigma x, you start at 0. Then at some point when magnetic field in this point, magnetic field points just along x, 
sigma x is almost 1, and then it goes down. And sigma y should be always should be 0 if you're adiabatic. But as we discussed, it's not. And of course, you know it in, in simple language. If you go to a rotating frame, there is effective magnetic field in y direction. That's the origin of this uh, uh, Coriolis force. Or if, if you don't know it, there is a physical, simple physical intuition behind. If you move slowly, but not infinitesimally slowly, spin lags behind the magnetic field. right? So this is your magnetic field. This is your spin. But if it lags behind, it wants to precess, and it tilts. So that's another explanation of this effect. And indeed, so this is the red line. So you see, it's not exactly 0. There is some bump. And now the statement, and of course, magnetic field is generalized force with respect to magnetic field, uh, right? Sorry, magnetization, I apologize. Magnetization, why magnetization, is generalized force with respect to magnetic field, right, like I mentioned. So it actually means that by measuring sigma y, magnetization along y, you measure your generalized force. So if you divide it by velocity based on this previous formula, this Coriolis force. So if you divide your y magnetization by velocity, it's angular velocity in this case, which they control, you should get better curvature. right? So and that's what they do. So it's approximately velocity independent. And moreover, if you integrate Berry curvature, you should get an integer one. And that's what they checked. And this is results of measurements. So, uh, but they were kind of clever. I, I, I didn't participate in this line of thought. So um, just measuring one is kind of boring. So it's interesting to measure transition. So when integer changes. So, uh, and uh, what they did, they introduced extra offset magnetic field along Z. So there is a rotating part of magnetic field, but there is also a static part of magnetic field. And now you can repeat experiment at different static parts of magnetic field. And now you can see what happens from this picture. If static offset is small, it means that you sort of move ellips your ellipsoid a little bit up or a little bit down. It still goes through 0, and we can apply stock theorem. We still get 1. And that's what's shown kind of what happens here. So this is, as a function of the offset, the Berry curvature which they measure. So the peak of Berry curvature moves. But if you integrate it, you should get an integer. Integrating over phi just gives you 2 pi. So you don't even need to worry about this. So And indeed, so they see this 2 pi to very good accuracy. But the moment the offset becomes too big, Actually, don't cover it. So your real magnetic field, which uh, spin fields, just does this, right? Instead of this, it does this. So if you have, it's easiest to see from the picture. If you have a static field, which is big, and dynamic field, which is small, when dynamic field goes around the sphere, static field just tilts and tilts back. So you should measure 0. And indeed, they measure 0 to very good precision. So it worked. Well, maybe one spin is not a big deal. It just turns out it's, it's yeah. Oh, it's time to stop. Uh, yeah, OK, let me just finish with this statement. So it turns out that th this model is just equivalent to a model of Chorn insulator. People like to study uh, topological insulators and so on. But there, it's, it's kind of the same model. Mathematically, it's the same model. And one thing I just want to say that one can ask how you can define topological transition for just one spin, one half. You know, transitions, phase transitions are property of like many particle systems. Well, the trick here is that you really study manifold of states. And manifold of states of spin one half is equivalent to one wave function of many electrons. Let's move on. So this was a two-level system, but it's already kind of interesting, especially if you witness how experimentalists work like first time they did experiment everything was wrong it was oscillating and so on and with Mike and experimental they figure out how to correctly do measurements and so on so even this like experiment looks very simple but because everything is done in the presence of oscillating field so it makes measurements much more subtle you have to do it correctly anyway but then there was another work also like in 2014 mostly done by Pedro Roshan uh, it's now in Google so they are building quantum computer now. 
10 years and we will all have our quantum smartphones. Anyway, but before they were doing that, they were kind of doing some interesting physics also. So, and they realized two qubits, two spins. So, and they were able to realize some magnetic fields and they also, uh, some coupling between them. I don't really, I, I really want to focus on other things. So, I I'll just want to flash you a diagram. So, this, this uh, really measurements, and this is not the best plot I got. So, they have better measurements. So, they measured using this method, short numbers, and they got regions where it's zero, one, and two. And zero roughly corresponds to a singlet, but it's the whole region. So singlet only exists when we have isotropic, when we have spin conservation, isotropic interaction. So here we don't have any spin conservation, but it's basically a phase adiabatically connected with singlet. So it's the same phase. It should have exactly the same topological number. Integer cannot change little. It stays zero. Then there is a phase which is similar to just one spin pinned by this magnetic field and one rotating. And they have a phase where both are rotating. And uh, it turns out that very recently, just well, a few months ago, there was a separate experiment in, in the double quantum dot um, by a uh, Hungary group. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, they actually even mapped uh, the topology of zeros, or if you want, of sources of Berry curvature. Because if, if this quantization should remind you Gauss theorem, right? We integrate electric field and we get a charge. So it's exactly the same story. And the sources of uh, uh, these churn numbers are magnetic monopoles, how they call. Well, you probably know the magnetic monopoles don't exist, but we, we deal with effective magnetic fields, so nothing prevents them. So in particular for spin one half, magnetic monopole is this dj h equals to zero point. And uh, the reason that you must have singularity is, is that, well, you, you see, in, integer, integral of Berry curvature cannot really change unless it becomes singular. But Berry curvature has a very well defined expression, right? The only way it can become singular if you have energy denominator, which is zero, because it's, it's in, right, then it can become infinity. So it means that the only possibility for this integer to change as we go through level crossing. And this is called magnetic monopole and so on. It's really not a subject of my talk, but I, I just want to show you some, some nice pictures. So this is more like theory, but in this uh, recent experiment, actually, uh, uh, they mapped uh, uh, these things. It's, it's kind of very cool. So we can think about components of magnetic field as our coordinates. So we live in parameter space. And we know that Berry curvature, and, and this is like gen fairly general, this two spin Hamiltonian. And now let's look into a situation when we are completely symmetric. We two spins feel exactly the same magnetic field. And then uh, this uh, magnetic field, oh, sorry, this ZZ coupling is the same as X, X and YY coupling. So it's a Heisenberg coupling. So S dot S. You might not recognize it, but if you write s dot s using z plus and minus notation, you will get this with g equals to 1. And this b naught offset is, is, is 0. And our coordinates are components of this magnetic field, x, y, and z. But now everything is completely symmetric. So it means that if integral of Berry curvature is equal to 1, then Berry curvature is 1 over 4 pi. It's a constant. If, Berry cur if integral of the Berry curvature is equal to 0, integral is 0. So we must have this kind of structure of the Berry curvature. It's 0 inside our singlet phase, or phase adiabatically connected to a singlet. So it's basically, a, well, it is a singlet in this case. And uh, it becomes immediately 1 over 4 pi, or whatever, uh, 2 pi maybe, uh, <coughs> uh, outside. So, and this is really a structure of electric field of a uniformly charged sphere. Now we can play these games. And again, I don't really know what it means, but it's a nice picture, so I'm showing them. So suppose we still keep the zero, but we change an isotropy. So we, we make interaction Jz different from one. Here it's zero, but it doesn't matter. It's different from one. And then uh, it's interesting that we actually get uh, our Berry curvature and this is, I remind you, effective magnetic field, which defines motion. If you think about magnetic field as some pendulum, 
like dynamical degree of freedom. So now it represents also an electric field if you have charge accumulation near the surface. So it's still kind of metallic surface and so on. But if we break symmetry between spins, so we make spin one um, uh, feeling slightly different magnetic field than spin two. So it's like anti-symmetric magnetic field. Then immediately we have a topological phase transition. So our surface completely collapses. And we have two monopoles, two singularities. And there are two more points. And they have special name in this topological literature, which I forgot. But this is basically two plus and minus charges which touch each other. It's kind of parabolic singularity. So if you break another symmetry between x and y, they will separate. And you'll get completely stable a situation of six charges, six degeneracies. And this will be totally robust. You all know that level crossing is unstable. You have a level crossing, and then there is always voided singularity. It's actually not true. What usually happens is that this level crossing just goes away from your plane to some other direction. So level crossings cannot disappear. Integral is conserved. So this level crossings now can move and so on. This situation where they had a sphere is unstable. It's protected by symmetries. So anyway, th there are cool things. So just to finish with this discussion, let me say that normal Hall effect and quantum Hall effect can be thought exactly in the same way. I said we can s this formula is completely generic. So it's the question how we define our parameters, our coordinates. So let's define our coordinates as components of a vector potential. So this A is the normal electromagnetic vector potential. I'm assuming that I have some static magnetic field, perhaps, acting on a sample. On top of that, I apply small electric field. But electric field, I can express through like an appropriate gauge and, and as derivative of vector potential. So I think about this AX and AY as my coordinates, my parameters. And I want to apply this formula. Now let's check. I, I divide by C for dimensions, but it, it's really not important. So now, what's the time derivative of this vector potential? Well, in the appropriate gauge, is it Coulomb gauge? I already forgot. It's EX. It's just electric field along X. So we can think about electric field as velocity, rate of change of our vector potential. What is generalized force? It's derivative of Hamiltonian. Sorry for curly, it's the same old guy. With respect to, say, a uh, y component of magnetic field. If you look into generalized force with respect to lambda y. But you remember, A is like shift on momentum, so dh dA is like current. It is a current, actually. So now we see that this expression really reduces to this expression. Now we have to figure out that we deal with periodic manifold. And this just comes from this Aronov-Bohm phase. Aronov-Bohm phase. And, and I'm not assuming that I, I am non-interacting. I have bands. It's fairly generic. And actually, I think Ashikawa first brought this argument, maybe someone before. So, um, so I have Aronov-Bohm phase. And I, I can assume that I have periodic boundary conditions, just for simplicity. But it's all not important. Like, it's a bulk effect, so the surface doesn't play a role. So once my Aronov-Bohm effect gets to pi, my wave function goes back, essentially. Right? So this means that I have periodicity in my coordinates, which is given by this 2 pi h bar over x times e. So and now I can integrate uh, this Berry curvature over this area. Well, but because. I have gauge invariance. F doesn't really care about what A is. I just multiply Berry curvature by the, this area and get an integer. And now from this, I immediately get my Hall effect, quantum Hall effect. So of course, we don't know what this integer is. It could be 0, but the point is it's an integer. Well, it, now we have to go to degeneracies, right? So if you have degenerate, you don't go back. If, if you have degeneracies, you can generalize it, and then you can get any fraction. So you have to go many times before you come back. So you don't have this periodicity. And probably you can never can come back, because now you live not in one, but uh, in uh, UN. 
Well, then it becomes even more interesting. You get this non-abelian stuff. Your adiabaticity, but in, in normal quantum hole like one third, I think you come back after three times. But yes, you can get phases when you never come back. This is really interesting. But then uh, this Berry curvature and everything gauge potential, they become pass dependent. Because I, I defined transformation of wave function with respect to lambda. But if I have degeneracy, I have to define how I transform. No, okay. and as I, maybe I'm wrong, but if you have degeneracy, just they stop to be, uh, well, A is not a number anymore. It, it now I understand, but that's what I'm saying. It depends on the pass. So you have to define it anyway. No, okay. It doesn't mean that it depends on the past. I think it does not depend on the past, but it depends. Uh, well, it has components. Okay. You, okay. You can define like two different passes, and you can have a vector space of. You can play all these games, but this uh, 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 derivative of the ground. So we define A as essentially the unitary transformation. It becomes indeed not unique, right? Because I said it's a unitary transformation which diagonalizes Hamiltonian. If I have degeneracy, I immediately have choice of which unitary. So and now you can define a space of unitaries and vector. Yeah, I'm not good. By the way, second chart number was measured exactly in the same way in, in Jan Spielman group very recently. So it's exactly, they created this degenerate manifold and they fi have figured out. You can use, so this derivation of the Coriolis force, this derivation, didn't depend on degeneracy, so it's still valid. But what you mean by Berry curvature will depend on the path. So if you change, by path it's a physical path, you physically change your parameter. So your result will depend how you change it, and what's your initial state. And they kind of used this, they explored it and, and got even second chart number, but let me not go on this. So now, now let me, uh, really flash uh, kind of general derivation. I, I kind of used the static perturbation theory, but in reality you can just do normal time dependent perturbation theory with respect to gauge potential. Moreover, you can really work with density matrices. You don't need to work with ground states anymore. You can work with excited states. So if you remember your time dependent perturbation theory, that's the expression which you get. It's completely a standard. It's basically Kubo response. So you get correction to the density matrix or to the wave function, which is proportional to integral of this lambda of t times commutator of your perturbation with your density matrix. If you don't remember it, it doesn't matter. And then from this, we can actually calculate uh, our observable. And that's a standard, what's known as Kubo response because we you now use standard perturbation theory. The only subtlety is that we will express our results through this gauge potential, which is kind of complicated object. But instead of, we want to express everything through Hamiltonian, through physical object. But remember, there is extra energy denominator. You have to remove it. And this energy denominator translates into extra integral in time. In this case, if you assume that you're in thermal equilibrium in imaginary time. So it's essentially a Kubo response when we have a double time integral. And if you remember your courses in many body physics, perhaps, then you'll get a single integral. But it's really to kill ener uh, energy denominator. There is nothing complicated. It's really first order perturbation theory. But now the idea is that let's assume what adiabatic means. Well, this is small and this is slow. So we can expand. We can first say that. Well, this is the correlation function, which rapidly decays. I have fast system, and I have slow degree of freedom. So I first can set t prime is equal to t, and I will get lambda dot of t prime. And then I can say it's lambda double prime of t times t minus t prime, and so on. And if I do this, I will write my response in terms of derivatives. And now it starts looking more familiar. So we get the Berry curvature, but we also get inertia proportional to acceleration. And we also get friction, proportional to velocity in general. And we get some other friction, which does exist in literature, but it's hard to find. So there are four terms. And technically, it comes 
well, we usually ascend all limits to infinity. Again, assuming we have time scale separation and we have oscillating exponents. And you know, if you integrate an oscillating exponent from 0 to infinity, you get principal value and delta function. One is real, one is imaginary. And that's why we, we get like two contributions, real and imaginary. One is symmetric, one is anti-symmetric. Anyway, these are details, so let me just say what the final result is. You actually find from this the expression for the Berry curvature, which I kind of gave you hand-waving derivation. So you have now complete derivation of the Berry curvature. And you also get final expression for the mass. I was just deriving it through momentum and so on. But it turns out it's uh, related to this retarded imaginary integral of the gauge potential. But in the classical limit, it's imaginary time. This is h bar is smaller temperature is large, classical or high temperature. This kind of this becomes a really interesting result. So it's proportional to the metric tensor. And there shouldn't be two, I apologize. There's two here, but not here. It's beta times g. And this is like a very interesting result. So the mass, the acquired mass, which we're computing, is nothing but this metric tensor, which defines the distance between wave function. So mass is geometric, at least in the classical limit. And actually, it's kind of interesting. And, and this, uh, I have no clue what's the deeper reasons behind. But for mar particle and both, this is nothing but a quipartition theorem, written in a kind of weird way. Because if we move in space, what is g? It's, ex it's x covariance of gauge potential, but gauge potential is momentum. What I'm saying is that mass acquired by the moving object will be equal to average of p squared, expectation value of p squared, divided by temperature. Usually, we write it the other way around. We just say p squared on average is equal to uh, whatever, mt. Right. This is a quipartition theorem. It's kind of interesting. So here, I, I, we are asking a dynamical question. So we are trying to push a heavy degree of freedom. And we ask how extra mass will stick to it. And it turns out it will stick exact same amount which is required by thermodynamics. It's kind of one of the amazing things. So perhaps there is a t it's trivial, but I, I stared at it for quite a long time. I still don't understand where it comes from. So <clears throat> moreover, one can, from this, you can even generalize the equipartition theorem. So we know that equipartition theorem is a classical, right? Quantum mechanically, it's not true. But if you use this definition of mass, you immediately see that quantum mechanically, uh, this mass is always equal to this integral. So this is true in any state, quantum or classical. Anyway, and from here, you immediately see, if you trust this result, uh, this general result, you see immediately why uh, our dilation mass is one third in the classical limit. First, I introduced it. Because it's just expectation value of x squared p squared. But average of x squared is one third of L squared, if I have this invariance. Right. So it doesn't depend. I, I'm not using any details of what, like, what my kinetic energy is, what my potential is. As long as my potential has this dilation symmetry, I will get one third. So and then you can indeed check that like, you can play with phonons or photons. It's much harder calculation. But you get this one third from there. And then uh, there is something even more interesting, at least uh, to me, it was uh, an, an interesting result. Then actually, from this adiabatic perturbation theory, we can recover the whole Hamiltonian dynamics. We kind of always say, at least when I studied myself, um, I was undergraduate in St. Petersburg, we were always told that it's fundamental, like landau lipschitz right, that Lagrangian depends on velocities and coordinates and nothing else. And that's wrong. So and uh, this is a good approximation, but it's wrong. It's like a simple example, which you probably heard, like Unruh effect. If we accelerate in a universe, we get correction uh, forces related to acceleration. So it's actually can, it cannot be literally true. So, but what happens is that indeed these terms appear as leading order of adiabatic perturbation theory. So let me just try to, to convince you, or at least show how it works, and then you can work out corrections. 
And it turns out that these corrections in real world are small because speed of light is small. So these corrections, various corrections to this uh, inertia forces, uh, which are proportional to acceleration squared or whatever, they suppressed by such powers of C, then you can just ignore them completely. It, it, but in artificial systems, you can sort of measure them. Anyway, so let me now assume that my degree of freedom, lambda, is actually a dynamical degree of freedom. Before I was saying it's an external parameter, but now it's promoted. There are no external parameters in nature. This is just heavy degrees of freedom. Right, like magnetic field comes from some current. So usually we say it's external parameter when we can suppress feedback. But there is always some feedback. And let's assume there is some bare Hamiltonian. Doesn't matter what it is. So let me just take there is some kinetic energy, some external potential. And now let's suppose we want to describe dynamics of this joint dynamics of, of this heavy degree of freedom coupled to my system, say spin system, or whatever, some Hamiltonian. Well, heavy degree of freedom is classical, so we just write now Hamiltonian equations of motion. But now the force acting on, on my heavy degree of freedom depends on, on wave function, right? On the state of my spins. And state of my spins, I should supply it with Schrodinger equation. And uh, in this psi will depend on, on how this parameter depends on time. So we'll get like self-consistent equations, right? My parameter changes wave function, my wave function feeds back. So uh, if, if you remember uh, uh, this, what's this force called? It's a diabatic force of electrons acting on ions. Slip of my. Anyway, it will come to my mind. <coughs> so anyway, leading order of approximation is well known. Uh, but now we can sort of go beyond the depth. So in the leading order, you can say that psi just instantaneously follows the ground state of lambda. Oh, Born-Oppenheimer, yeah. So and then we, that's how we get Born-Oppenheimer force. So I move heavy ion, electron moves. Because electron moves and there are other ions around, it changes its orbital. Because it changes its orbital, it effect affects forces acting on this ion, so we get extra forces. And that's famous born of Heim approximation. But now we can go beyond. Of course, one can say we, we want to solve this whole coupled system, but it's complicated. But instead, we can say, well, let's just use that this object, this external force is slow. And then we can just use. Uh, what I wrote, so we, we I, I just, in the previous slide, I, I wrote what this is, right? Yeah, this is generalized force as a function of t. I just plug it in, but now I get self-consistent equations of motion. I can move terms from the left side to the right side, and then we see immediately that this kappa becomes correction to the mass. This is anti-symmetric, ignore it, and it, it's small. This is friction, it appears as a regular friction, but again, if I uh, have a gap, friction is zero, or if I blow temperature, so you can ignore it, I get this Coriolis force, and then I get born oppenheimer static force and, and, and this. So in some sense, what we see is that the whole, let, let me just assume that friction is small and negligible. It's always there, but let's assume it's small. So then I just look at the structure of these equations of motion, and moreover, I just see they're not just Newtonian, they're really Hamiltonian. I can define Lagrangian. I don't really want to go through details. You can convince yourself that uh, what you recover is that effective Lagrangian, which describes a uh, heavy degree of freedom, where uh, Berry connection plays the role of vector potential. And you get this renormalized mass, which is determined by geometry and, and everything else. And here you just see why mass emerges. Because if my bare mass is 0, I have a piston, which is very, very light, coupled to many particles. It will acquire the mass. It's a leading correction in non-adiabatic response. So we just see, we actually do recover macroscopic Hamiltonian. So if you want Hamiltonian dynamics, follows from Hamiltonian dynamics. It's kind of like in statistical mechanics. From microcanonical ensemble, we recover canonical ensemble, and then we go back to show its equivalence to microcanonical. It's a consistent theory. So in this sense, Hamiltonian dynamics is just consistent theory. It reproduces itself. It's a loop. So in this sense, it's kind of hard to, to find what's more fundamental. It's, 
Anyway, so you just see that all forces, like, they really come from uh, uh, this non-adiabatic response, and they really determined by equilibrium. I, I mentioned, like, mass is uh, uh, the sign of the mass, for example, depends on sign of temperature. So mass always comes with the same sign as dissipation. So thermodynamics is always a queen. Whatever you do, thermodynamics wins. So, and there are, of course, deep reasons behind. <clears throat> so, and details of microscopic theory is not important. So, details will, of course, depend on your theory, but not, not the result. And moreover, the mass and Berry curvature, they really come from virtual excitations. And therefore, you just see why they're hard to find, because they depend how much you dress everything. And interesting that this inertia mass, as I said, it's actually related to the metric tensor. And, and anyway. I wonder how this uh, is connected uh, to fluctuation dissipation theory. Uh, yeah, so I, uh, I'll mention this. In, in, so fluctuation dissipation theory always work. Like, for example, energy fluctuations. You can compute energy fluctuations. They are just given by the metric tensor. I will come to this. And the fact that mass is beta times this is actually fluctuation dissipation theorem. So it all satisfies. And of course, here, what's underlying here, I'm assuming that I, I'm perturbing equilibrium system. But then again, I'm, I'm seeing that if I study leading non-adiabatic response, my thermodynamics is still uh, consistent. So it's like I acquire, because at least a priori, I still don't see a reason why. If I start pushing particles, I should, and not necessarily pa particles, it can push some, I don't know, some photons, some scalar field, whatever. Uh, I'm dragging vacuum with me. Why I should add as much, so this extra stuff, as equipartition theorem will require? I have no clue, but somehow it works. So maybe there is a very simple explanation which I'm missing. But anyway, so let me show one. one example and then I move to, to other uh, like even more exciting I think topics so th this is how we can apply it so uh, I, I showed example so let's say we have a heavy degree of freedom which is some rotator and it's coupled to spins in this way and then uh, we want to solve this joint system of equations so uh, now they're more complicated but it's standard Hamiltonian equations for angular momentum can define Poisson brackets and so L? L is angular momentum, N is a conjugate, it's a direction of rotator. So it's like theta and phi. So, so uh, then uh, this is really a standard problem from Landau Lifshitz, except that I have quantum spins and then I have to add self consistent solutions. So my spins, I have to write Schrodinger equation for my spins, and they feel n plays an effective external magnetic field. And then uh, I don't want to guide you through this. I actually already derived correction to the uh, moment of inertia before. If you remember, it's simple. So it's the same what you get. You also get this Coriolis force. You get equations. They look a bit complicated, but if you project them into equatorial plane, you will see that Berry curvature still plays the same role. So if I am say rotating at theta equals to pi over 2, so an equator, then rotation velocity long phi causes acceleration long theta. So it tilts the whole thing. So Berry curvature still plays a kind of a role of the Coriolis force. Anyway, so you can study this joint dynamics for 20 spins using exact generalization. You can use this formalism, and it's the same. And this formalism is, of course, much easier because you don't really need to solve dynamics. I mean, the only equation you need to solve is this classical second order equation. So you are actually gaining a lot because you, uh, it's true only, of course, close to adiabatic limit, but you just find, yeah. We consider L to be quite large, right? Yes. That our spin is okay. Yes, yes, yes. Because you have to have, you have to be adiabatic. It should be slow. I mean, large, here I, I take it as a classical object. So in this sense, it's large. Uh, for quantum spins, we didn't check, but I suspect as long as it's slow, then it should be fine in quantum systems as well. So, and there is another work which I, I uh, uh, did in collaboration also with Mike Kaladrubitz and Ami Katz, who is my colleague at BU in high energy physics. And here, again, it's, it's, I'm not really expert in high energy, uh, but 
So we did the problem in, in uh, the sizing model. But essentially, uh, it, it kind of tells us about very interesting engineering phenomena. So let's assume that we have a heavy degree of freedom which goes through some critical point. So think about heavy degree of freedom as a magnet uh, which changes magnetic field. And at some point, you can cross critical point where you have a phase transition. So if you use high energy analogy, we can think about this scalar field uh, which changes Higgs mass. And there is a point, critical point, where Higgs mass is 0. That's our critical point. And it's interesting that near this critical point, my mass diverges. Remember, mass is related to metric tensor. And metric tensor is inversely proportional to the gap. And this is sort of a clear, if you think about the polarons, which Eugene was dis uh, describing, the softer the coupling, the softer the phonons, the smaller the gap, the easier it is to dress with phonons. So they are much more susceptible. Right? And then what actually can happen, and this is quite generic, that your heavy degree of freedom can be localized. It can move and then can be stuck at this point. And moreover, it's robust. Even if you introduce small slope, it's still robust. So you can have actually dynamical localization where the system tunes itself to a critical point. So, and that's interesting. So the reason is that in critical point, we have smallest gap, so dynamic reason. I, create, I can create largest amount of entropy, because I can actually distribute my energy among largest amount of excitation. So there is a thermodynamic reason again behind that. But it's interesting, it just comes out from this formalism. And there's a lot of interesting stuff going on.